Father, we thank you that your word has the ability to change our lives and has the ability to change our minds so that our lives can be changed. So this morning we submit our hearts, our minds, our lives to you. Every marriage that's represented, every relationship, every individual, every family that's represented in this place, every situation or challenge that might be represented as well, we give it to you, we lay it at your feet, and we ask that you would use this time to mold us and shape us and grow us Change us, Father, during this time through your word. We give you permission to do that in our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Today we're going to conclude a two-part message called Now and Later. Now and Later. And what we see is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, some of the Apostle Paul's very last writings, he's writing from a prison cell in Rome, really where he's awaiting death, execution, He's writing to Timothy, and he's writing as a spiritual father to Timothy, who is a spiritual son. And last week we began this message, and what we talked about was how Paul, from his wisdom and his experience, speaks into Timothy's life and gives him instruction through his writings. And what's really cool about this is that at the beginning of this passage, Paul looks at Timothy and says, Timothy, in your future, you're going to be dealing with some things that are going to be different than what I've dealt with. You're going to walk through some seasons that are going to be new. And a new generation of challenges is going to have to be met by a new generation of leadership. But you can do this, Timothy, and I believe in you. So Paul gives Timothy some really simple instructions. And he says, Timothy, if you will do these things now, then Later, you'll be in my shoes, and you'll be able to look back over your shoulder and say, I did it well, I ran my race, I did it to the best of my ability, I have no regrets, and I saw that God was faithful. But you're going to have to make those decisions now if you want to have that fruitful life later. And I think those same instructions apply to us today. If we can make decisions to follow and be obedient to God's word now, we will bear fruit in our lives later. And Timothy writes, or excuse me, Paul writes to Timothy explaining these things and explaining these instructions. And let's just recap really quick what he said so that everybody will understand what we're talking about today. He says, Timothy, there's coming a time where believers and non-believers alike will no longer endure sound doctrine. They're going to run off looking for teachers, looking for voices who will affirm their worldview rather than allowing their worldview to be shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to be going and looking for messages and voices that will tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. There's coming this challenge down your path, Timothy, and you got to be ready for it. So Paul gives Timothy some really clear instructions. He said, when these things happen, Timothy, number one, in, in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 4, he says, be watchful in all things. We talked about how in the original writings, this has nothing to do with our eyes. It's not about watching and observing and being swayed by everything that's going on around us. It's an emotional stance. We look, we observe, and we respond accordingly. We're not moved. We're not swayed. Our feet are firmly planted in the word of God and in the promises of God. He says, you've got to be watchful, Timothy. And then he goes on and he says, and you're also going to have to endure afflictions. Now, nobody likes to focus on afflictions, but if we focus on endurance, we'll make it through the challenges of life. We talked about what it means to have endurance, and if we will be willing to endure, we'll allow God to work and make us stronger, and each mile of our life will make us stronger for the next mile that's in front of us. Think of the marathon trainer, the one who's going to run that marathon. You can't get ready for a marathon running one mile every morning. No, you have to build miles upon miles because each mile makes you stronger for the next mile that's ahead. Timothy, you're going to have to have endurance. And then he says, you're also going to have to do the work of an evangelist. We talked about how if we remove that word evangelist, which was Timothy's calling, we can all think of our calling for our lives. And God has equipped and called each one of us to do something specific, but we're going to have to be willing to do the work. And if we will be faithful with the work that's in front of us, God will be sure that we are fruitful in the long run. God is calling us to fruitfulness. Our responsibility is faithfulness. Timothy, you're going to have to be willing to do the work. And if you can do those things, it will ultimately culminate in you fulfilling your ministry. And it's with that thought of fulfilling ministry that I want to transition and now move from what Paul, the instructions that Paul gives to Timothy, and let's look at Paul and the way that he reflects upon his own life. I love his writings right here. He says, Timothy, if you can do these things, you will fulfill your ministry, or you will make full proof 
of your ministry. We talked about this last week, and I want to focus on this for just another moment, how that word fulfill literally means to fill full with what God has given me. So imagine you in your life. God has given you gifts, talents, and abilities, and the life that is in front of you is this blank canvas. It's an empty jar, an empty vase, where God is calling you to pour out everything that he has poured into you throughout the course of your life so that as you pour out what you have, while you are being emptied, you're being filled with the satisfaction of using the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given you. You can pour it all out but be full filled or filled full in the long run. That's what Paul is saying about his life. And what's so cool about this is this serves as a transitional thought to the very next thing that the Apostle Paul says here. And I want to talk about these next few reflections that Paul has on his own life because his reflections still serve as instructions for us today. How many of you have ever had somebody in your life that was always quick to give you instructions on how to do things? And it's amazing when God brings people into our life whose instructions are valuable. But I think we all know what it's like to also have people that we've encountered or have people in our life who really want to give us instructions, but we look at their life and we're like, I'm not so sure I want to be taking my instructions from you. What's interesting about this is that Paul doesn't just give instructions, then he turns around and reflects on where he's been and what he's done, and he's lived this life that is worth emulating. I said this last week about being a generational church, and I'll say it again. People of all generations, can we agree this morning that if we will look to, another, look to one another to add value to one another, we can give and receive from each other and add value. The younger people in this room right now, there are people who are older than you that have something to give to you. And if you look at their life and see that it's a life worth emulating, be quick to listen to their instructions. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so this is what Paul has to say when he talks about fulfilling his ministry. Look at verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Look at the picture here. God gives you gifts. He wants you to pour them out. I find fulfillment in the pouring out of my gifts, and I fill up that empty jar. I paint on that blank canvas of this life that God has laid before me. And so you see Paul at the end of his life saying, I filled up that jar with everything that God has given me, my gifts, my talents, and my abilities. And recognizing that he's at the end of his life, he says, I'm being poured out now as a drink offering. The reason it says drink offering is because the word offering in the original writings here literally means to make a drink and to offer it to someone else as a gift. And he's saying, my life is being poured out as a gift. Unto who? Unto God. I was amazed when I read through this and studied it out the way that multiple Bible scholars see this as Paul's life being poured out as an offering to God, but also to humanity. And this makes a lot of sense when you read a lot of Paul's other writings. Paul said in Philippians 1, watch this, many of you will know this passage well. Philippians 1 and verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And he goes on and he says this phrase that we know so well. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What's he saying? He's saying as long as I'm living, breathing, walking on this earth, my mission and my message is Christ. And so my life is to be poured out as an offering that shows the world around me the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if my life should come to an end, guess what? I only lose my life, and I have heaven and eternity to gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So that's the picture we see of Paul's life being poured out as an offering to God, but also as a witness, an offering to humanity. And I love that thought because it really helps us to understand that as long as we are walking on this earth, God is calling us to honor him, but live a life that's an example for others. So... Paul goes on here and reflects on his own life, and I want to take these reflections and, again, turn them into instructions. This is what he says in verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So when looking at these reflections, the very first thing that Paul says is, says, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. Here's the first instruction if you're taking notes today to everybody in the room. If you want to get to where Paul is later in life, number one, 
you got to fight the good fight. you got to fight the good fight. Now, maybe you're wired like me, and if somebody starts talking about fighting, you're like, listen, I'm not really born to fight. It's not my nature. I don't really care for confrontation. It's not something I want to do on a daily basis. But guess what? Sometimes in life, we have to choose to fight even if we don't want to. And why is that? Who are we fighting, and what are we fighting for? We'll talk more about that in just a moment, but... When you look through these words right here and you look in the original writings of what Paul is saying when he says, fight and fought, I have fought the good fight of faith. The word fight here is this word agon or agon that we see in the original Greek, and the word fought in the past tense is agonizomai. And what it literally means, it's the, English, or it's the Greek word from which we get our English word agony or agonize. He says, there have been times in my life where whether I wanted to or not, whether I chose to or not, I had to agonize and fight for something that was ahead. And think about Paul for a moment. This is a man who took the good good news to the Gentile world. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. And many Bible scholars, if not most, think that he died at least once in some of those beatings only for God to bring him back to life to continue the mission that was in front of him. He went through a lot. He went through some agonizing events and series throughout the course of his ministry and his life. Now, when we see that word fight here, I really want to make sure that we understand what this means because it doesn't literally mean a fist fight, even though that helps us to get a good picture of how we can go about, you know, doing well in the fight of life sometimes. But watch this because that word there literally means to be entered into the competition, When we get to the next point, I'm going to talk about competition a bit more, but right here when I see fight the good fight, what I see and what I I think of in my mind, Pastor Gary talked about boxers who enter the ring and box with one another. We've all seen boxing matches, or maybe you watch the UFC. Maybe you like both, maybe you prefer one over the other, but either way, we see a fight between two fighters. And here's what's interesting about this is, if we were to take the word fight out and use a different word, I think it will help us understand this better. Think of the word contend. Because when I think about the fight of life, what am I fighting for and who am I fighting? Because we say all the time here at the bridge that we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Why? Because Christ has already won the victory on our behalf. So if you think about a fight, this is the picture I want you to get. When we think of fights, whether it be boxing or UFC or something like that, we think about the champion who has the belt and everybody else is fighting or contending to get a shot at the champion so that they themselves can get the belt. Well, guess what? Jesus has already won the championship. And so when Paul talks about fighting, why do we have to fight for a championship that Jesus has already won? Because when we look at the picture here, what we actually see is that Jesus has won the prize, and he's made the victory and all the spoils available to us as well. So who are we fighting against, or who are we contending against? Well, Scripture says that we have this adversary, the devil, who prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I think about that for a moment, what I realize is that the devourer, the devil, the adversary, he's not prowling around trying to defeat Christ. He's already been defeated. You know who he's trying to defeat? Us. So you know what we have to learn to do every single day of our lives? We have to learn to fight the good fight. And if we will fight, if we will contend, we will have the victory that Christ has made available to us. And I hope that that helps to put victory in perspective for what Jesus has done for us. Now, you might be saying, how is it exactly that we fight? Well, Scripture gives us, you know, all kinds of examples when it comes to the armor of God or the things that we can put on. But let me just give you some quick practical things real quick. First of all, do you ever think of prayer as a weapon? Because I love how we simplify prayer here at the bridge to help people understand that prayer is simply communicating with God. But I'll tell you what, you can go to battle in prayer. And when you go to battle in prayer, you bring the person who's already won the battle into the fight with you. And sometimes we take for granted everything that's available to us in prayer. If victory is accessible, then how come I skip the opportunity to reach out and grab it for myself in prayer? That's one of the ways that we fight. Can I tell you another way we fight? Through praise and worship. Praise and worship declares the victory before I've actually got through the battle. But the beauty of it is that it invites the presence of God into the process. 
And I think everybody will relate to this. Has anybody ever come? Not ever, probably most Sundays. Do you ever walk into this place and when we corporately are worshiping God together and the presence of God is here, you just feel like you can go bear hunting with a switch, man. You're like, I'm ready to like attack hell with a squirt gun right now. Because together we get into the presence of God and he is here with us. He's encouraging us. He's lifting us up. He's speaking to us. And we know we got the victory because we're having an encounter with the one who's already won that victory. But then we can easily, <laughs> we can so easily go home and feel defeated. An hour later, 30 minutes later, we get in our car and we're already having a fight with our spouse. Or the challenges of life are staring us in the face again. Can I tell you something? The same God who is here during praise and worship on Sunday morning is the same God that wants to be with you Monday through Saturday and walk through every single battle that you might face. Don't leave praise and worship on Sunday morning. Don't leave it in this room. Take it with you, in your car, in your house, everywhere you go, and invite the presence of God to get involved in your situation and stand strong and fight. Amen? And, you know, the word of God is an incredible weapon. Faith, for this battle that you're facing, it comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I love what our bridge women um, study groups, our bridge women small groups are doing right now in our church. And I know we got all kinds of women who are here in service right now that are a part of our groups. But your map study is amazing. Meditate, apply, proclaim. Listen, meditate. I sit on the word of God. What does it have to say about my situation? And I don't just leave it on the page. I get it in my heart. I meditate on it. I sit over it. I look over it. I make sure it doesn't stay there. It gets here. And then I begin to apply it. What does it say I need to do in this situation? And as I apply it, as I'm waiting for that victory to come, I start proclaiming the victory that God has given me every day of my life. What a powerful weapon that is in the fight that you might have in front of you. Now, before we move on to the next thing, I wanted to spend the most time on this one for one reason, because there's a really good word that Paul uses here. He says, don't just fight. Fight the good fight. So if there's a fight that is to be fought, and it's a good fight, do you know what that also means? That means that not only can I fight well, I can also fight poorly. There's a bad fight. What does that mean? If you look at the original writings here, that word good literally means beautiful or beautiful to look upon. Handsome is actually one of the words. Good to look at, beautiful to look upon. It's the way in which you went about fighting. And I'll go back to the boxer analogy, or maybe UFC, whatever you prefer. Maybe you've watched a fight and you saw a great fight. Maybe one fighter just dominated the other one, was so much better. Or maybe both fighters were great, but one was just a little bit better and they got the victory. And you look back and we celebrate those wins. We celebrate those victories. Wow, the crowd goes wild. What an amazing job they did. Until three days later, it comes out on ESPN that they failed the post-fight drug test. <laughs> because guess what? Sometimes people win dirty. I think what Paul's saying here is really a nod to integrity. Because a lot of us try to get ahead in life thinking that we're winning the fight, but we do it through shortcuts. We do it through some sort of slack morals where we just let the rules slide and say, eh, I'm willing to cut these corners to get ahead. Paul says, no, you need to fight the good fight, and it's an integrous fight. It's one that when you look back, you won't be ashamed of how you fought. Paul reflects on his life and he says, I know I fought a good fight. I fought a clean fight. That doesn't mean it was always beautiful. and It doesn't mean that I didn't get knocked down a time or two. It means that I'm here at the end. I'm still fighting and I have no regrets about the way that I fought. I think he's telling us that we need to be able to get to the end of our life and have no regrets knowing we fought a clean fight. And guess what? If you fight a clean fight, you can put the results in God's hands and he's going to take care of the rest. Amen? So Paul says, Timothy... I fought the good fight. You need to learn how to fight it too. Look at the next thing he says. He says, I finished my race. The instruction to us today, we got to learn how to finish the race of life. Finish your race. Now, I want to use some more specific language because the original writings are so good throughout this passage, and they really help us out. Again, we see Paul using a word that kind of implies competition. And Paul is reemphasizing that we must live our lives with that same kind of endurance and skill that he instructed Timothy about earlier. But if you read this in other translations, the King James here doesn't use the word race. It uses the word course. I finished my 
course. And I love that word because it differentiates what we're actually talking about specifically here. See, when a lot of us think about a race, we think about competitors on a track competing against one another. And there's good stuff to be taken from that. But in order for a race to happen, each competitor on the track has to find the lane that they are going to run in. And what it reminds me of is each one of us are gifted differently. We're wired differently. God created each one of us just a little bit differently, making you uniquely you and me uniquely me. And there is a lane that God wants me to run in. There is a course that God wants me specifically to run and a course that he wants you to specifically run. And the reason this is important is because I think sometimes we can get busy looking at other people's lanes and looking at other people's courses and we say, well, I like their lane better. Well, I like their course better. Or... We can look at how good we're doing in our lane, and we can say, man, I'm a whole lot better of a racer than they are. And when you see that word race, it's easy to think of comparison and competition because we've all watched the races in the Olympics, right? If each runner is in their own lane, they have to look. They have to compare. They have to compete with the others because they're all going toward the same finish line. But what Paul's talking about here isn't the same thing. It's not a race the way that we normally know it. He's talking about a course. It's a specific calling. The original writings say calling or even career, a specific path that God has for us. And so with that said, if God has called you to run a specific race, a specific course, and he's called me to to run a specific course, let me give you some really deep spiritual advice. You ready for this? Stay in your lane. Have you ever just wanted to say that to somebody? You just stay in your lane, all right? I'll run my course. You run your course. This is my lane. My lane. No, no, no. My lane. Step back. My lane. Here's what's interesting about this. We are going to answer to God for how well we ran our course. And there's good news in this. I'm not responsible. God will not hold me accountable for how well you ran your course. And great news for you too. God's not going to hold you responsible for how well I ran my course. We just have to stay in our lane. Now here's why I love this. There's such an important word. Paul doesn't just say, I've run my race. He says, no, I've finished my race. See, when we watch the Olympics on TV, everybody's running toward the same finish line. But here's why I love this. You and I, in this life, none of us know where the finish line is. And in a race, everybody's running toward the same finish. But in each one of our individual courses, our responsibility is to run and finish the course God has called us to. And none of us know where the finish line is. Paul writes this at a time in his life where he looks ahead and says, I know my finish line's in sight. I know it's coming and I got no regrets. Can I tell you something? The thing that would scare me more than anything else is my finish line coming for me, me not knowing it and having regrets when it came. But I'm not responsible for how you run your course and you're not responsible for how I run mine. We're simply called to finish the course, the lane that God has placed us in. Does that make sense to everybody this morning? Timothy, finish your course. I would invite you right now if you're taking notes to not just write finish the race, finish My course. What lane has God called you to run in? Maybe when you think about your life today, you think about your calling, your purpose in life, what does God call me to do? Can I tell you something? If nobody has ever told you this, God has a specific course and a specific lane for your life, and guess what? He has equipped you with all the gifts, talents, and abilities that you need to run well in that lane. And if ever you should stumble and find yourself in a moment of weakness, that's why the strength of Christ is always made perfect in our weakness. Just stay in your lane and finish your course. Amen? Now, I love the next thing that he goes on and says here. Paul says, I look back and I recognize that everything I've been through, number three, I've kept the faith. So here's the final instruction. We want to make it to the end and we want to do it well later. Looking back with no regret, we've got to keep the faith. Now that sounds really simple. The doing sounds really simple. But even in theory, that statement alone, keep the faith, 
That sounds really simple, right? Here's what's interesting about this to me. When Paul says, I've kept the faith, that tells me that if you are required or God is asking us to keep our faith, it's entirely possible that we could give our faith away or it can be stolen from us. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about your faith in the promises of God and the plan that he has for your life. If Paul says that he's kept his faith, I didn't give it away and nobody stole it from me. I've gotten to the end of the journey and I'm still holding on to it. I didn't give up. No matter what I went through, no matter what came against me, I've held on to it. I've still got my faith. I'm still intact and I'm as strong as I've ever been when it comes to my faith. Let's talk about what that means to keep our faith. See, Jesus had some interesting things to say about this and you know, who was Paul's faith in? It was in Christ and what Christ had done for him. Jesus said this in John 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. No matter what you walk through, no matter what you come up against, you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trials. You're going to go through things. Stuff's going to happen because we live in a fallen, imperfect world. Things are going to happen. But guess what? Be of good cheer. Other translations say take heart. Why? I have overcome the world. That's the hope that we have in Christ. That's the peace that we can have in our hearts. But we have to be the ones who choose to keep our faith. And here's what I mean by that. I'll give you a quick example. In Luke chapter 8, one of the most common, commonly known stories in the ministry of Jesus in Luke 8, Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. The winds and waves are coming. The disciples think they're going to die. It's the worst storm they've ever been in. And where's Jesus? He's asleep in the boat. And so the disciples see how loud the wind is and how big the waves are. And this is the picture I want you to get. Because of the loudness of the wind and the bigness of the waves, those things began to get bigger than the promise that Jesus had given them that they were getting to the other side. See, when we start to listen to the wind and the way, listen to the wind and watch the waves of the world around us, soon if we allow those things to get bigger and bigger and bigger, our faith will get misplaced from the promises of God to the storms of our life. And it's not that we, we, we intend to lose our faith, it's just we suddenly see those things as being bigger or stronger, and even if we don't realize it, our faith has been misplaced from the promises of God to the storms of life. So what do they do? They go and wake up Jesus and they tell Jesus, we're going to die! Literally, we perish. That's what the, write, the writings say. They go and wake up Jesus. Jesus calms the wind and the waves. And the very next thing that we see happen is Jesus looks at him and says, okay, okay, everything's cool, right? Wind and waves, gone. Everything's at peace. I'm awake. I'm with you. Everything's all right. Now, let's review. And Jesus asks him this very simple question. He says, where is your faith? And if you know this story well, I, I love to preach on that passage because Jesus is literally asking this. Are you able to locate where you placed your faith? Because when the wind got loud and the waves got big, you forgot about what I told you. Your faith is somewhere back in the ocean with the wind and the waves. And I'm here to remind you that if you put your faith in me, I'm going to get you through the storms of life. And I think Jesus wants to remind us of that today. And when we look at what Paul's talking about here, we have to understand that our faith is something we have to guard. We have to hold on to tightly because if we will hold on to our faith, we will overcome the challenges of life. But it easily gets misplaced when we put it in those loud voices, the winds and the waves of this world. Don't give your faith away, my friends. And don't allow your faith to be stolen. Find yourself at the end of your life like the Apostle Paul saying, man, I've been through a lot. I've endured a lot of things, agonizing stuff. But at the end of it all, I've been able to let go of some stuff. But the one thing that I didn't give up and the one thing that hasn't been taken from me is my faith. I've kept my faith. What's your big challenge right now that's screaming at you? What's that wave that feels like it's going to crash over your boat right now? Don't allow the wind, the volume of the wind and the size of the waves to allow you or to make you, force you to misplace your faith. Hold on to your faith. Put your faith in the promises of God and you will get through this storm. Finally, in conclusion this morning, Paul comes back and he says one last thing and completes this thought before he moves on and gives Timothy some final instructions. But I love what he says here in verse 8. We read it a moment ago. Finally, there was laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, 
interesting phrase, that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, when Paul talked about the good fight and he talked about the race of life, he understood that the prize for his labor would not be given to him on this earth, but it was going to be given to him in eternity. Specifically here, he calls it the crown of righteousness, which is laid up for him. That Christ, the righteous judge, is going to give to him on that day. When we talked about the finish line earlier, we don't know when that day is. We just know that it's coming. And so it was as if Paul used his whole life, sowing his time and his life into eternity, into something that would outlive him. What I love about this is the way that he concludes, because in the, in the process of encouraging us to sow our lives temporally into eternity, he goes on and he says something that's so cool, and I just identified with this, and it painted this beautiful picture of his life. He goes on and he says, God will not only give me that crown of righteousness, but not, not just to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This word appearing in the original writings is so cool because the word that we see here is actually this word uh, epiphania. It's from which we get our English word epiphany. And he's saying, there's a crown of righteousness that's not just laid up for me, but it's laid up for every single person who has had the same epiphany that I did, which is an encounter with Christ. That word in the original writings, its literal definition is not just an encounter, it's a brightness. And if you know the story of the Apostle Paul, his name previously was Saul. He was essentially a Pharisee and a persecutor of the Christian church. He helped to kill Christians. And one day he's on this road to Damascus and suddenly there's this brightness, this bright light, this blinding light. And as he goes down, just taken out by this brightness, this epiphany that he's having, a voice speaks through the light, and it's Jesus. It's the voice of Christ himself saying, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it's through this encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, this epiphany, if you will, that Paul's life has changed. He's no longer Saul. He's renamed. He's now Paul. And he goes, and he becomes one of the most effective leaders, evangelists in the early church, and really one of the most famous Christians that we have from the word of God. And I love the way he reflects on this because he says, everything changed when I had that epiphany. There was this appearing that happened. And because of that appearing that I love so much and that I value so much, I look back knowing that everything changed in my future at that very moment. And I've walked out everything God's called me to do. I've been faithful. I've kept the faith. I've fought the good fight. I've finished my course. And there's a crown of righteousness that will be my eternal reward. What's so cool about this is that Paul understands that the rewards of heaven are so much greater than any reward we could ever get here on this earth. For a lot of us that are busy running our race, it's a race of comparison because we look at people in their lanes and we think, man, they're doing so much better than I am. But let me remind you again, nobody knows when the finish line is coming. So who's to say who's winning and who's not? It's just up to us to do the best with the course that God has placed us on. And I look around this room today and I realize that there are a lot of people who had that epiphany in their life, that brightness where you encountered Christ and everything changed and it set you on this new course that God had for your life. And maybe your story's like mine. You can look back to these moments of your life where you had these epiphanies of brightness where it was like God just stood up and spoke to you and said, I got something better. And everything changed from that moment on. If you're like me, I'm grateful for that day because I look back and as Paul said, I'm glad, I'm happy. I, I celebrate the appearance that I had, this appearance of Christ in my life. But maybe you're here today and when we say those words, you love the idea of having a fulfilling life, finishing your course well, keeping the faith. But maybe the reason why you haven't, you don't feel fulfilled in all those areas is because you haven't yet had that epiphany of Christ calling your name and saying, hey, I got so much more for you. See, everything changed in Paul's life when he had that epiphany. Everything changed in my life when I had that epiphany. And this is a room full of people. Everything changed in your life when the same thing happened to you. And if you're here today and you've never had that encounter with God, I believe that right now he just wants to bring a brightness upon your light, shine some light into your life. And he wants to say, hey, I'm right here. I've been here all along. I've got better things for your life than you have for yourself. 
I've got a better future than the one you have planned for yourself. And not only that, I want to give you an eternal reward that's, in the, that's so much greater than any reward you could ever get in this life. And I'd like to pray a prayer in just a moment and invite you into that relationship with God. Because if you step into that relationship with God, you can look forward with faith and not fear. You can look forward knowing that you're going to spend eternity with God. And you can find the course that God has for your life and you can set out and you can run it well. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning? Father, I thank you for all the people that are here today. You see where each and every person is in their life. Some of them walking closely with you. Others maybe walking distantly with you. And others who are just walking. They haven't yet had that encounter. They haven't yet made that decision to invite you in and let you shine your light, your bright light into their life. Maybe people are here in this place today, God, and they feel like they're just walking in darkness. The darkness of this world, the darkness of uncertainty, the darkness of their regrets, the darkness of their failures. Maybe the thing they need more than anything else is for someone, you, to come and shine your light into their life and show them that you have a better course, a better path, a better future for them so that things won't stay the same. If that's you today and you're in this place and you know that you need to invite God into your life to let him shine that light, that bright light into your life, I want to invite you to say a prayer with me here in just a moment. We're going to do this together with heads bowed and eyes closed. We're not going to put anybody on the spot. We're not going to embarrass you. We just want to give you a simple invitation to step into a relationship with God. The way that we do that is by saying yes to Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who came and died on the cross, the sinless, spotless, only acceptable sacrifice for our sin, died a death that we deserved for our sin. That's how much God loved you. That's how much God loved me. And through that sacrifice, Jesus not only bore our sin on the cross, but three days later, God raised him from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave for all of eternity so that you and I would not have to face it. And we can have that peace for eternity if we'll simply say yes to that sacrifice that God made for us in Jesus. I want to invite you to pray a prayer right now. Just repeat these words after me. It's not about magic words. Just mean it with everything in your heart. Say these words right after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you are the Son of God, and I believe that your death was full payment for my sin. So today, I choose you. I want you to become the Lord of my life. I put my faith in you, my hope in you, and my trust in you. Today, tomorrow, and into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can I tell you, if you made the decision to commit your life to Christ, to invite him in today, hand over lordship to him, if you did that, you join a company of people that made that decision at some point in their life as well. We are so grateful that you did that. Can we just put our hands together this morning and welcome some people into God's family. Now listen, this is a very important moment for people that made that decision, so we want to honor all of you that did that, and we want to respect you during this time. So hang tight for a moment until service is over, and everybody listen to this. If you made a decision to follow Christ, we want to give you a gift. It's a simple tool called the Next Seven Days. There's a couple of different ways that you can get it. Right after service, we'll have prayer teams along these walls down here on the floor. Just walk up to one of our prayer teams, let them know you made a decision to follow Jesus, and they'll give you that book. We don't need anything from you, but we're happy to help in any way that we can. We feel like it's our responsibility to help you start walking with God. If you need to go quickly at the end of service, just stop by the next seven days desk. It's right between the glass doors before you exit the building. Let them know you made a decision. You want to get the book, they'll give it to you and help you in any way that they can. We are glad that you made that decision. Congratulations. Well done. Way to do that. Hey, one more time, we want to welcome you into the family of God. Can we put our hands together and welcome some new, new family members today? Can we say thank you to Pastor Zach for that message this morning? That was great, great great direction for our lives you know sometimes we get to the end of our service and we set aside this time to talk about giving to God and we're not one of those churches that spends a lot of time begging for money we don't do that we believe that our giving is a part of our worship to God just as much as our singing just as much as our lifting our hands just as much as the life that we live 
Our giving is a part of our worship to God. We do it out of obedience. We do it out of thankfulness, but we also do it in faith, knowing that God blesses us as we honor him. And I want to say thank you today as pastor. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. And on the screen, we always show you the different ways you can give. If you're watching online, there are instructions there as well. And, you know, when we give to God's work, we're not just saying thank you. We're planting seeds for the future of the church, for what we're going to be able to do. And we're living in a crazy world today. We're living in crazy times. But every time I give back to God, it enables the church to take the seed of the gospel, plant it in more lives, and make a difference in building the kingdom of God in the earth. So I just want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness. We'll be good stewards of all that you give back to God and to his work. So God bless you as you give. If you're in the house today and you want to give a physical gift, there are envelopes in the seat. You can just put it, whether it's cash, check, whatever it might be, credit card information. Just fill out that envelope, and then as you exit the building here, the auditorium, on each side of the doors, there's a giving station. There's also a giving station out at the children's check-in if you're picking up kids there. So just thank you so much for your faithfulness, and as much as I can thank you, God will bless you for your faithfulness in giving. Before we go today, one last thing, and this is really, really important. Next Sunday evening, we're having a team night here at the bridge. We haven't done this since before COVID broke out. How many of you remember when COVID broke out a couple years ago? Anybody remember that? Okay. Y'all are sure quiet this morning. That's supposed to be funny. I guess it wasn't very funny. Anyway, I remember when COVID broke out. We haven't really done a team night since before COVID broke out. And we decided we want to do a team night. And the thing about a team night, it's a fun night. We do some fun things. We're going to worship God together as well. But what we do at team night, we just really renew the vision in the heart and life of everybody who's involved in ministry here at the bridge. So if you're serving anywhere on any team, if you're leading a connect group, I mean, whether it's out in the parking lot, in the lobby, in the kids' classrooms, on the worship team, women's ministry, men's ministry, any area of the church, even youth ministry, Pastor Corey's on vacation, but even youth ministry, if you're involved anywhere, we want you to join us next Sunday night. We're going to feed you and have some food together. We're going to have child care. We're going to feed your kids as well. But we need you to register. You can do so by going on the church app, or you can take the code here on the screen, get your, your phone out, grab the code. If, if you've never joined a team but you're interested in getting involved, join us that night but please register we want everybody here we want to appreciate you we want to encourage you and there's some things in my heart that i'm going to be sharing sunday night that are really really important so we want everybody here next sunday evening for our team night it's going to be a fun great night finally have you enjoyed being in god's house today hey we love you we appreciate you so very much thanks for joining us stand to your feet have a great great week and we'll see you Sunday.